Good morning, Hazlitt Community Church. Welcome to worship on this World Communion Sunday, a Sunday when we recognize that our siblings in Christ around the globe are celebrating communion on this day. At Hazlitt Community Church, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome and you are invited to celebrate communion with us with whatever food and drink you have available to you where you are worshiping. I'm the Reverend Betsy Aho, joined also this morning by Reverend Aaron Heisler and other voices and talents that went into putting the service together. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're worshiping with us. I look forward to our morning and our communion with one another. Let us worship together. Hear these words of our call to worship this morning. A table is set, a feast prepared for us, a meal of bread and wine of the food and drink we have gathered. The Lord calls us to the supper of remembrance where all are welcome. The Lord calls us to serve and be served. When we break the bread and share the cup, our understanding may fail us but we will never forget Christ's example. We will never forget the full extent of his love. We come to worship this morning in recognition and celebration that we are a global family and that being a part of a global community is a blessing and responsibility. Let us worship together. Please join me for our prayer of approach. Forgive us when our minds and our welcome are narrow. Forgive us when we do not trust that you will provide. Forgive us when we lose our sense of worth and are overcome with shame or fear. Today is a new day. Today the table will be wide and the welcome will be wide and the arms will open wide to gather us in and our hearts will open wide to receive and we will come as children who trust there is enough and we will come unhindered and free and our aching will be met with bread 
and our sorrow will be met with wine, and we will open our hands to the feast without shame, and we will turn toward each other without fear, and we will give up our appetite for despair, and we will taste and know delight, and we will become bread for a hungering world, and we will become drink for those who thirst, and the blessed will become the blessing, and everywhere will be the feast. Amen. Last week, we heard the story of Joseph and his uh, coat of many colors and his interactions with his brothers, the sons of Jacob, Israel. And our story left with Joseph and his brothers, the 12, those who would become the 12 tribes of Israel, settling in Egypt because Joseph had found favor with the Pharaoh. Much time has passed between that story and the scripture that we find ourselves in today. No longer do the Israelites have favor with the Pharaoh, and in fact, they have increased greatly in number, and the Pharaoh is becoming very concerned that they will rise up because the Egyptians now have the Hebrews, the Israelites, in slavery, in captivity. Moses has been born. He has been rescued from the river by the Pharaoh's uh, daughters and has grown up an Egyptian but recognizes the injustice of the Israelites and is now an adult. And we find ourselves in the scripture today steeped in the story of the Exodus, the Passover, the escape from Egypt. Hear these words from the book of Exodus chapter 12. I'll be reading the first 13 verses. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. 
This is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord." The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. Where I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. For today's children's moment, we're going to play a little game. In a moment, I'm going to show you a picture of a tray. On the tray, there will be many items that I have found around my house. You'll look at the picture for about 10 seconds. And then the object of the game is to see how many items from the tray you can remember from that brief time of looking at it. Are you ready? Okay, how many of you can remember five things that you saw on the tray? I put the items on the tray and I'm not even sure I can remember five items. How many of you can remember eight? 10? You'd have to have a pretty fast brain to be able to remember 10 items in 10 seconds. We did this today because remembering is an important part of our service today. In the first scripture reading, we heard the story of the first Passover, an event that was so important to the people of Israel, God's people, that they remember it in their faith practices often throughout scripture. Jesus and his family and his followers, they would celebrate the Passover every year. And people of the Jewish faith still today celebrate it as well, they pause and they remember this important story from their faith history. Today is also World Communion Sunday, a day when we gather with Christians all over the world at Christ's table and we remember the last Passover that Jesus celebrated with his disciples before he died. At that Passover, he taught them that when we eat bread and we drink from his cup at his table, he taught them to remember him. You see, when we look back and remember the stories that make up the history of God's people, our ancestors in the faith, we remember what those stories teach us about God. When we look back, we see our God as one who keeps promises made. We see a God who sent Jesus so that all might come to know and experience God's presence even deeper and all might have a taste of the new life that God offers in Jesus Christ. So when we gather to look back and remember as a people of faith, we're often then reminded of God's steadfastness, God's goodness, and God's grace, which then fills us for hope for the future.
God brought the plagues upon Egypt after giving Pharaoh so many chances to release the Hebrews from slavery. And the death of the firstborns is the tenth and the final plague in response to Pharaoh's hardened heart. Indeed, after that final plague, the Pharaoh finally allows the Hebrews to go, and they escape through the Red Sea. This is a story that may be familiar to many of us. And Moses speaks to the freed Hebrews and says these words from Exodus chapter 13. Moses said to the people, Remember this day on which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, because the Lord brought you out from there by strength of hand. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today, in the month of Abib, you are going out. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your ancestors to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey. You shall keep this observance in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a festival to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen in your possession, and no leaven shall be seen among you in all your territory." You shall tell your child on that day. It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. It shall serve for you as a sign on your hand and as a reminder on your forehead so that the teaching of the Lord may be on your lips. For with a strong hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt. You shall keep this ordinance at its proper time from year to year. A couple of years ago, a college student came into my office, I'll call her Jane, who was just dipping a toe back into church waters after being very hurt by the church years before. At the time, I was leading the campus ministry program at the People's Church and had this group of thoughtful, welcoming, faithful, questioning MSU students and young adults who I just knew would make Jane feel safe and included. While the students did what I knew they would, it was the scripture that was the trouble. Jane's very first night joining us for the Bible study that I had invited and encouraged her to attend, the scripture we discussed included the first Passover and the escape of the Hebrews through the Red Sea. This story of freedom from slavery and oppression for the Israelites is also a story of innocents being killed for the sins of their parents and an army drowned for following orders, the Egyptian army. And while Jane was brave enough to return to an institution that had hurt her, to hear of a God that saved one people while causing death for another was hard. And she spoke up. She was clearly disturbed to hear of the violence God had wrought on the Egyptians, knowing even that the Pharaoh had also wrought death and destruction and violence on the Hebrews. Certainly, God could think of another way to save the Israelites, she protested. God is God. And the conversation for the evening remained in the uncomfortable wrestling of that. And it was good, and it was difficult. And Jane came back, came back for another Bible study, came back to church, remained an active part of that group and of the church as a whole. And I think conversations like that should be difficult. We recognize that as part of the Judeo-Christian tradition, the story of Passover is part of our story too. The Passover is what Jesus was celebrating with his friends and with Judas, the one who betrayed him, on the night that he was arrested. Our sacrament of communion is connected to Passover, and in a time where there are people over here and people over here and 
things are really, really separated, it is hard to get to a place where we can see a whole story, a whole complicated story that causes both joy and sorrow, freedom and death, a place where we can recognize and rejoice that our God is a God of freedom for the Israelites, the the good guys, the underdogs, the oppressed in this story. God's chosen people blessed to be a blessing for the world, but also recognize and mourn that there is hurt and harm and death in this story, both and, both and. What a rare and fascinating concept these days. At face value, God rescues the enslaved at any cost. And because it's scripture and we're always on God's side, at least while we're reading it, we think everything that is written as God doing it must be something that if, if we see it as being anything but completely amazing and good that we just don't understand. Somehow we have to rejoice in the loss of life because the scripture said God did it. But what if we take a moment to acknowledge, like Jane so boldly did, that this story has parts of it that are painful, that there is hurt addressed in the story that we can't avoid upon its reading, and also that by God's hands the Israelites were delivered from captivity in Egypt, rejoicing and empathizing simultaneously. Maybe part of the lesson of the Exodus is that freedom is possible, but oppression has consequences. Maybe in the wisdom of the scriptures, the divine knew, the divine knows, that there will be folks reading these words who are captives, and there will be folks reading the words of Exodus who are oppressors. And there will be folks, many of us, reading who can identify with both, who carry both privilege and stigma. Humans polarize. We bring that tendency even to our reading of scripture, but God is showing us that in life and in death, in the freedom for the oppressed, things are messy and complicated. We can acknowledge in the messiness and the complication of life that we know that we care about some really wonderful, amazing, good police officers. And yet still acknowledge systemic and acknowledge and challenge systemic racism. We can have a strong disdain for online school and feel like it's not safe to go back. We can be lovers of our country and challenge it to be better. We can be angry that protests sometimes turn violent and still support the cause and the voices of the protesters. We can love scripture and wrestle with it. We can be faithful to God and still have moments of doubt. We can have convictions that we stand in and still recognize that we are still being shaped by God in Christ's redemptive grace. The story of the Exodus, of God freeing the Israelites from slavery and oppression, is the identity-defining story for Jewish people. Passover commemorates the story. In response to Moses' words to the Hebrews, which we heard in the second reading today, to remember this day on which you came out of slavery, tell your child it is because of what the Lord did for me. It is important to the centrality of our God being a God of freedom from slavery and oppression not being forgotten that those stories are told. In the same way, the meal that we share today, the bread and the wine, or the cracker and the juice, or the cookie and the smoothie, whatever you have as your combination of food and drink, 
is also commemoration. Jesus instituted communion on Passover, on the night of his arrest. Communion is linked in that way to remembering the freedom of Exodus. And in communion, we remember that we are all offered the freedom that Christ offers in his life and death and resurrection and promise to return someday. The Passover occurred in the context of resisting an oppressive empire in Egypt. The Lord's Supper occurred in the context of Jesus resisting the Roman Empire's oppression and violence through peace and humility, out of love for the whole world. Communion invites and encourages us to keep remembering Christ's continuing story and rejoice in Christ's love for us. But just as we hear of the Exodus with thanksgiving for God, being a God of freedom, and also mourning the death in the story, we can enter into communion rejoicing in the grace, hope, freedom, and abundant life offered to us in Christ, while also recognizing that the inbreaking of God's kingdom that occurred on the cross is a continuing story that is still being told, and it is a complicated one. Jane struggled, as we all should, with the ancient story of Exodus. As we come to the communion table with our siblings in Christ around the world, might we come with rejoicing for all Christ has done out of love for us and for the world? And as we remember, as we teach and encourage the faith of the generations around and behind us, let us invite the uncomfortable questions and conversations. God is a God of freedom from oppression, yet not all are free. Jesus is a healer of the sick, a feeder of the hungry, an amplifier of the silenced, a finder of the lost, a lover of the unloved, releaser of those captive to sin, death, slavery, and hopelessness, and a uniter of the divided. But there are still those who need healing. There are still those who are hungry and silenced and lost. There are still captives, and humanity is still far from unified. I believe that it is in the authenticity and recognition of the complicated, continuing story of our faith that we are encouraged, like Jane, after that first hard Bible study, to come back. Come back to hope for a better tomorrow. Come back to worship week after week. Come back to faith when it seems to be waning. Come back to telling the story to generations and to come back to the table, the table of grace, the table of hope, God's table.
We give thanks on this World Communion Sunday that in a world that is often not united on so many fronts, we have this opportunity to gather with our siblings in faith close by and around the world and feel connected through this table, this table of grace, this table of hope, this table to which all are invited. And while we worship in our homes and perhaps are feeling a bit disconnected, let us today recognize and celebrate that we are all invited here, all present by the Spirit. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Most gracious God, today we gather as a global community around the table you have set for us. On this day, especially, we remember your prayer that we might all be one, one creation, one world, one body. As the bread is broken, the cup poured, the prayers and praise offered, we remember your Son and the gift of grace offered, not for some, but for all. As we join our hearts and minds and spirits together in prayers of thanksgiving giving for the gifts of this table, Remind us that in the bread and cup we may just glimpse your kingdom. Holy One, bless us as we enter into this sacrament that we might see all of your goodness reflected in the cup and we might see our brokenness redeemed in the beautiful simplicity of the bread. Help us to taste your compassion and live Jesus' passion for love, justice, and peace. Send us into every part of this world with hearts that have been kneaded into the softness of tolerance and care. Send us, God, refreshed, nurtured, blessed, and always thankful. Amen. Amen. We remember together with, what el with whatever elements we are celebrating with this morning that on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus gathered with his friends and with the one who was to betray him, and he took the final loaf of bread, gave thanks for it, broke it, and said, This is my body, given for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. After all had been fed, he took the cup, and he gave thanks for it, sharing it with them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, for the forgiveness of sins, each time that you drink of it, remember me. And so, as you uh, celebrate the sacrament of communion in your homes, take the bread which you have, or the food which you have, and the drink which you have before you, and celebrate in remembrance of Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this opportunity to celebrate communion with one another and with a global community. Might these gifts nourish our bodies and our spirits and equip us for work in your world, sharing your love and your grace with all who we meet. We pray together with great thanksgiving the prayer that Christ teaches us as we say in united voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hi, everybody. I wanted to explain a little bit about the postlude for today. It's a combination of songs. The first song I call Blocks and Stones, 
And the second song is, With Joy Draw Water. And I combine them. You'll probably recognize it, but I wanted you to know, Blots and Stones has its roots in um, an Iona community song that explains that in our lives, the things that are, that are the most challenging, that seem like stumbling blocks to us, are actually in our lives, the stepping stones that move us on to the next um, stage of our lives. And I want to really, in a way, dedicate this to all the people that are struggling with so much in our country and around the world um, on this communion, Worldwide Communion Sunday, um, and a hope that it's helpful somehow. Thank you. A couple of ministry connections to share with you. One is that a week from this Sunday, next Sunday on October 11th at 10 o'clock a.m., we will be celebrating worship on our own church lawn. We will uh, have outdoor worship for all who would like to attend. We'll also live stream that service and put it on the website and on Facebook. So if you're more comfortable worshiping at home, you are welcome to do that as well. We ask that you wear a mask, bring a chair, only come if you are feeling healthy, and we will celebrate worship with one and all while remaining safely distanced from one another. It's also Crop Walk next Sunday, so I hope that you've had a chance to see the video or read the news about that. There's more information about all of these things in the October newsletter that was just emailed earlier this week. There are hard copies available in the document holders in front of the church, and many of you uh, can check that out on the website as well, hazlettcommunitychurch.org. And being October, this is also the season of stewardship. We are grateful for the ways that you have continued to support Hazlitt Community Church with your time and with your gifts throughout this very strange season of being the church without walls. You will receive a letter shortly asking you to plan for the upcoming year so that we might also plan for the upcoming year. Friends, I am grateful for your presence I am grateful for the ways that you reach out to me, to the church, to one another, and continue uh, caring for God, feeling God's love, and also uh, sharing your friendship with one another. Let us keep doing those things. As you go from this place, go as one who recognizes that our stories linked to the story of God who we know in Christ and by the Spirit who is with us. Our stories are complicated. Let us embrace the complication so that we might go out into the world authentically who we are, sharing God's love and God's grace and God's peace. Amen.